God's grace, His mercy, and His peace be with you tonight through Jesus Christ, your Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've been doing a, a discernment series for, wow, several months now. We've gone through different preachers. And now we've been going through discernment with respect to music, especially congregational singing. There's all different types of music, and we all have different tastes in music. And as Jeannie mentioned on the way out last, uh, last week, and I completely agree, and it's one of my points I was going to make, is that uh, men and women hear music differently as well. So a woman will hear a song a certain way and watch a, uh, experience a worship service a certain way. Men experience it in a very different way. And I'm giving you my perspective, so that might be a little different from yours, maybe partially because of gender, also partly because we're all different. And we all have different designs and personalities, how God has put us together, like our fingerprints are all unique. So I don't expect you to have in complete agreement with me and all my tastes in music, just mostly. No, no, just kidding. Um, no, but, uh, and I don't, of course, I'm not going to completely agree. We all have different tastes in music based upon who we are. But we're talking about what kind of music I believe, as your pastor, the church should have as congregational singing for the basic uh, main, main uh, hymns of the service, namely the opening, the sermon hymn, the closing. We have different types of hymns I usually choose for communion, which are more quiet, meditative, a little bit of a different beat, easier to sing, kind of pretty, because it's more of a meditative, quiet, prayerful time. The other ones I want to be bright, royal, and as we talked about last week, militant with the, with the sense that it has a, uh, uh, a militant rhythm to it, which is basically all traditional hymns. So any traditional hymn you choose pretty much has that beat to it. You know, you can have, a mighty fortress is our God. You can see a, a U.S. Army Marines, or U.S. Marines, I mean, uh, marching to that one. The Marines, sorry, saying Army, Colonel. <laughs> um, you also have uh, any of those songs, you know, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Uh, oh, worship the King, all glorious above. So you can see them marching into battle. Uh, so many of our hymns are that way. When we went through the discernment, uh, this was part one two weeks ago. We talked about what is music, Luther's views, what the Bible says about music, music and creation, the whales, the wolves, uh, the, the sea, the thunderstorms. We talked about music in the church throughout history. We should have looked at images of that or examples of that. The power of music and the kind of music I believe the church, uh, I think, should be singing and needs to sing for our, our battle. Not last week, we looked at this one. This was our outline last week, part two. Why we need a militant rhythm, which again is all traditional hymns, namely because we're in a cosmic war against forces unseen, but real and fierce. And we just can't, remember the Zulu show, we, the British could not have fought all those savage warriors singing, you know, my little buttercup, you know? Or, or Mary had a little lamb. They had to sing the Marine marching song for their courage and their fortitude for the battle. I think we need also, as a congregation, in our general songs that we sing, to be those that are going to drive us forward for the great mission quest of the church, to, to be faithful to our king, to fight the good fight of the faith, to endure to the end and finally receive the crown uh, and then cast our crowns before the king, Jesus, on the last day. So we're in a Catholic battle. We looked at, does the devil use music against us? Oh, yes. And is there the devil's music in the Bible? Yeah, we looked at uh, Mount Sinai when they were worshiping the golden calf and Moses heard the sound of singing, which was wicked, actually. It was of a, a dancing to a false god when they should have been worshiping the Lord. So the devil uses music. We looked at rock and roll last week, um, at the history of it, and how, you know, the, the militant music, that's the word I'm using for it anyway. Our music, the church traditionally is, you know, either da, 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 or the first beat we're accenting, or the third beat, you know, da, 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 marching to battle. Rock and roll accents the back beat, which is erotic or sexual. That kind of thing. You can hear that when you listen to that kind of music. Um, that's why it's so exciting to us, but it wakes us up much more than other types of music sometimes. 
We saw its effect on plants, just a quick picture there. Plants, Lord, a lot of experience seem to say they'd like the classical music. The spirit behind rock and roll, we saw a few of the bands that, uh, the Bob Dylan, the Beatles, that had talked about even making packs with the evil one to get where they got, fame, fortune, money, sex, uh, all those kinds of things. And we saw how music is super very powerful, namely that, uh, I started with you about the, um, the fair where that riot was going on, where all the gangs were fighting each other, and someone quickly changed the music, put on classical, Handel, or... Mozart or something, and they just they couldn't fight to it, and all the all the fights broke up because the music you just couldn't fight to it, and so uh, that was rap music or something before, very angry. So whoa, don't take a picture of that yet. That's later. I put that up. Wait, let's, let's go through this one first. That's those are the answers. <laughs> Can't give the answers first. Probably already read them, but. Now let's take a look. I want to look at what, what's happened to the church's militant, namely that military rhythm, I'll just say, music. Now, when I say militant, again, that doesn't mean all of it is fighting music. It's just in that rhythm. For example, A Mighty Fortress, we sing militantly. Chief of Sinners Though I Be, that's in the same kind of rhythm, isn't it? Still, Chief of Sinners Though I Be. You can, you can march to that, but no, as we sing that one very quietly. That's usually, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, Jesus shed His blood for me. So even that's in the same rhythm, even though it's a prayer and it's much softer, right? So, um, so let's trace the history of music. What's happened to the church's militant music? Is it still there? Where did the march rhythm go? Has the devil tried to snatch it from the church? You know, if you were in a great fight and your army that you were battling had a great marching song, it would be great to give them a different song, wouldn't it, if you could? One that was not so attuned to fighting. Wouldn't you do that? Now... Verdict's out on what I'm going to say about that or what you're going to think about that. But let's just say if you were the enemy, you would definitely want to change the music if it were uh, in empowering the opposite troops. So John Wesley, uh, he was a guy, of course, starting of the Methodists in the 1700s. He lived, was born in the early 1700s. The Methodist movement began in, the, uh, in England, of course, and then and then in America, George Whitfield, etc. Uh, in the mid, mid or early 1700s, and uh, um, Wesley lived to about 1790s or so. He was out of the Episcopal Church, I mean, sorry, the Church of England. And uh, his emphasis was more, the Methodists, not on doctrine so much, but on heart, emotions, and feelings. Um, not so much justification by faith, but the experience of the Christian on piety, on good works. So Methodists were really about the method for being holy. It was a holiness movement. And um, uh, one thing I didn't really care for about Wesley, although I really liked him in other ways, but in the end it seemed like he ended with universalism. Namely, he, he so departed into feelings that he thought everybody was going to be saved. Uh, by God's grace regardless of uh, justification by faith. So that's a problem. But, but I believe uh, the church's music began to change with the Methodists. Even though uh, Charles Wesley, uh, sorry, John, John Wesley, I mean, wrote a number of the hymns that we know which were still in that militant rhythm, such as, Our God, our help in ages past, or Awake my soul, awake my soul, and with the sun. And can it be that I should gain? Uh, then when I survey the wondrous cross, thou whose almighty word. So those are some great hymns we use. So I like a lot of the hymns he wrote and his, uh, he wrote and his brother wrote. But remember, his, his emphasis is less doctrine. And the Methodist church were knowing, known for being much more of a clappy, upbeat, happy, more of emotional movement compared to the traditional Reformation hymns, okay? And so the essential part of the Christian holiness is giving the heart holy to God, uh, said John Wesley. And that's a big thing. It's all about your heart, giving your heart, not just the straight doctrine, you being justified by faith in Christ. It's a lot of that emotional feeling stuff, okay? 
it kind of drifted slowly. He started it kind of, but uh, we're going to see where that went, is, at least as far as I believe it can be traced. I could be wrong, but I, this is the way I think it, it worked. Methodism spread, by the way, by circuit riders on the western frontier of the United States. How did it become so populous? We have Methodist churches everywhere when it only started in the middle 1700s. Well, when the American West was being settled and the frontier, everybody was moving west across the mountains and into the plains and the prairies, um, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Catholics all stayed on the coast. Who went west? It was the Methodists on their circuit riders. Uh, and then also the Baptists. That's why we have the Bible Belt that stretches across the United States, which is mostly Methodists and Baptists because they're the ones who went west and evangelized the frontier. So it spread and become very popular, popular. Then out of the Methodist church came something called the holiness movement. Have you heard of that? I might have mentioned it several years ago when we did the history of the church, but the, the holiness movement was kind of developed out of the Methodist church when the fire and zeal and the emotionalism of being on fire for the Lord sort of dwindled in the Methodist church. And they wanted to get the fire back, the emotionalism, the excitement. And if you weren't emotional and excited, you weren't on fire with the Holy Spirit. Well, that's not, not necessarily how it works. You can be on fire and be kind of cool as well. But, uh, so, but they were trying to get the fire back into the church, the emotionalism, the enthusiasm. And then kind of the idea is if you're not emotional in these things and pouring your heart, giving your heart, pouring it all out, you're not really that spiritual. You can kind of see that today, right? And some Pentecostals are like, oh, those Lutherans are so boring. They're, never, they're not crying and weeping. and They're just kind of boring people. And that doesn't mean you're not spiritual. Um, there's different ways of worshiping, and I'm not saying their way is bad, but, uh, but it was the emphasis on enthusiasm. That's where you get in, the, in America. Uh, the America is a big phenomenon called big tent revivals. You've heard of those? Mm -hmm. And you have that, you see that with... Later on with Billy Graham, that kind of huge, let's get thousands and tens of thousands of people together. America loves big things. Americans love big, booming enterprises. And we're going to save everybody and we're going to make it like business and we're going to, the American dream, spiritualized, sort of. Um, in the 1800s, you had Charles Finney and Big Tent Revivals. They would get people together with um, uh, big gatherings, performances, emotionally manipulating preaching where they would not so much just doctrine, but they would move, it was designed, there was, there were strategies for moving your emotions to make a commitment and a decision for Christ. Uh, emphasis on charismatic gifts and being slain and filled with the Holy with the Spirit. Uh, altar calls, that's where that comes from. That's where you get altar calls, is from the uh, big tent revivals. And you see that a lot of churches won't ever end a service if they're Baptist without an altar call, some of them. So anyway, any rate, the holiness movement is the vision of John Wesley that had left the Methodist church. The fire had dwindled. There was a renewed desire to return to holiness. Holiness movement particularly sought to restore the New Testament truth of divine healing. Okay. Certain holiness churches, we don't have to read them all. Wesleyan Methodist Church, Pilgrim Holiness Church, Free Methodist Church, Pentecostal Holiness Church, etc. And the holiness movement just a couple things I wanted to emphasize on that list here of the American holiness movement is it de-emphasized the tradition of the church. That's going to be important when you're changing the music later on, de-emphasizing tradition. Also, be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, we, of course, are baptized in the Holy Spirit at our baptism. They're looking for second indwellings uh, where you get charismatic gifts and uh, supernatural uh, manifestations. Uh, it's a more, they emphasize a more emotional worship style. That's very important for the change of music. You gotta be emotional or it's really not very spiritual. A shift towards tabula rosa belief. I had to look that one up. It really means a return to a clean slate, break with the past. You have nothing on your plate for church tradition. You're just gonna go and reinvent it going back to the early church. So it's basically abandoning getting a clean slate from any of the church's past traditions in these things. So there's no, you're not, you don't feel any being bound to anything of the previous uh, times. You're gonna, you can reinvent everything. 
absence of preconceived ideas, the rejection of tradition and history. Okay. I feel a little bit of that sometimes as a Lutheran pastor. I'm not bound to our tradition. I like our traditions, but I also am not bound to it. Uh, if any time the Lord wants to move in a different way, I'm open to that. But I do like our traditions. We're going to jump ahead into the 1960s and 70s from the holiness movement. You have that sheet I gave you, by the way? You can trace all this on the church history, going up the route of the Anglican church over here. See that? I'll have to explain this whole sheet sometime to you. You go up the Anglican Church of England, out of which you get the Methodists. And then out of that, you see, if you follow it all the way up, you get the holiness movement over here. And out of that, at the top of this part of the tree over here, you get Pentecostals, Assemblies of God, Foursquare Gospel, Calvary Chapel, and Vineyard Ministry. Calvary Chapel is what we're going to talk about with the Jesus movement. See how music's changing all the time? I got someone's phone going off. That's great. Jesus Movement. You've, you've heard of that one, right? You probably saw the movie recently. What was that called again? Jesus Re Resurrection. Revolution, was it? Resurrection. Are you talking about the chosen? I mean, no, no. The, the what? Jesus Revolution. Jesus Revolution. The one that was out recently in the movie theaters. It was about this uh, Jesus Movement. About the revivalism amongst the hippies out in the 1960s and 70s on the California coast. And uh, let's take a look, because this is going to majorly change music. It was, it was evangelism to the, well, the hippies, really, in California, which is a very great ministry in those days. They were reaching out to the lost young people, you know, peace and love, man, all that stuff that you would say in those days. But then they, would, they were taught by especially Chuck Smith, you need Jesus. Okay, Chuck, Chuck Smith is the head of Calvary Chapel. Got a picture of him coming up shortly. But this group brought into the church their culture and their music. So when they saved all these people out of California um, and across the country, the Jesus movement in those days, 60s and 70s, when all those young people were saved, they also, in this holiness movement church, which actually came out, out of the book, Methodism, ultimately, with the emotionalism, all that stuff, they brought in, and their lack of need for the tradition, they brought in all of the tradition, culture, of the hippie culture at that time, including rock and roll. Then, so, that's what we're going to see. They brought with them the music as well as their culture. By the way, you can have all kinds of different types of culture and all different types of rhythm and music. If you're in the Spanish culture, this can be different. African that's different. You can have a number of different rhythms and types of music and cultures, but the thing is, it's, you're still in a cosmic battle. You need music that's still going to win the war, whatever culture you're in. Okay. So Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. Have you heard of Lonnie Frisbee? I talked about him some time ago, but there's Chuck Smith on the left. It's a photo. Lonnie Frisbee on the right. What's Lonnie Frisbee look like, or who does he look like? Jesus, right? That was one of the great catch things of those days. He looked like Jesus. And he talked very softly, and I've watched a few interviews with him on TV, and he looked very, he's a well-spoken well guy, loving guy, and he was very charismatic. And so they together went onto the beach and preached to all the hippies. Lonnie, having been a hippie, he actually entered the ministry. Here he is on the right, the real guy. This is the one in the middle. He's in the movie, is he? Okay. So the guy on the right is the actual guy, Lonnie Frisbee. He um, originally had his call into the ministry when he was on a mushroom drug trip. He was tripping. And he got a call to become a Christian preacher in that mushroom drug trip. Um, and he was very charismatic. He's the one, rather than Chuck Smith, who really drew in the huge crowds of the hippies and, the, and through his preaching. And it was a big movement. Um, the thing is, though, is uh, he had a contradictory life. Yeah. And his parents would, would say, like, how can you, Lonnie, be having drug-filled, orgy, homosexual sex with men on Saturday night and then be still preaching Jesus Christ Sunday morning. 
Lonnie continued to do that, and he later confessed to that later in his life, but I mean, that wasn't known for a while, that was covered up for a while, but so that's a problem. <laughs> that's a very great contradiction. Nevertheless, he was very instrumental in getting uh, Calvary Chapel going and the Jesus movement. Um, if you saw the movie Jesus Revolution, the clergy in that movie, I didn't see the movie personally, but I heard the one clergy guy there was portrayed as kind of backward and being not connecting with people. I didn't see the movie. You can verify if that's true or not. I don't know. But um, that's kind of how the tradition of the church was kind of... I mean, they didn't pick up on the tradition of the church. They brought in what? A different type of music, is, which is what we're talking about. Out of that came a great change in the church's music. Love Song was one of the early uh, bands. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, but uh, they had very non-traditional hymns. They created their own music. That's okay. But they changed the rhythm. Um, from, uh, they brought in a lot of the more hippie rock and roll into the, in the movement. Um, da, 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 da. And, it, and it seemed kind of nice because it was lively music, fun music. It wasn't, you know, some of the old traditional hymns can seem kind of stodgy, a little slow by comparison, not as pretty in some senses. So, um, carrying their music have, have merrily down the way. And you've heard of Maranatha music, haven't you? Okay, what kind of songs do we get from them? Some of them that we sing, and I'm okay with some of these songs, okay? How great is our God? Uh, our God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save. You know that one? Or, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. I have no problem with the words, and the rhythm's okay. Is it the steady diet that I would give to the church to fight Satan? No, but I can sing those songs at other occasions and not have a big problem, whether we do it here on Wednesday nights. So we do more of those kinds of songs Wednesday nights. Not always, but a little more. But nevertheless, notice the music's changing, isn't it? Then you get vineyard music comes out, uh, that's also on your sheet there, out of the Calvary Chapel wing. You get songs there like, Come, now is the time to worship. Sorry, I was off pitch there. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Uh-oh, what's that sound like? Wesley, doesn't it? It's all about giving your heart to God. And there's the emphasis again. But that, notice that hymn, that song, I should just say, that I sang you, was very different from a military rhythm. I don't know how you're going to, I mean, you can maybe worship with it, but how are you going to fight the devil and march forward and bear your cross and die for the Lord and be loyal to him unto death to receive the crown of life with that song? I'm not saying you can't supplement with it, but as the steady diet of the church, uh, it's at least, at least my opinion that uh, that wouldn't be the kind I would choose. The Jesus movement grew in numbers while other churches were declining. So this, I just chose these pictures off of <laughs> Google Images. Jesus movement is like, boom, it's exploding. People are flocking to those kinds of churches. And what's happening to the traditional churches? It seems so dry and slow. Those other churches are uh, declining in numbers, as we saw uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s. You see that? And so what did those other churches think? Well, they are getting their people through music. Let's take on their music as well. That's what we saw in the 80s, right? What happened? The question was, which music to use? Churches had that question. Should we stay with the traditional, which all the older people want, or should we stay with the contemporary, which a lot of the younger people want? Right? So on this side, you have the, the more holiness music, emotional, lift up your hands, praise God, uh, versus the more uh, regal, militant, older traditional hymn type of thing. Two very types of Different types of music, aren't they? And notice what happened to churches. They split. So, oh, we'll have the traditional 8 o'clock and the contemporary at 11, because the younger people don't like to get up early. The older people will get up early, and they'll have theirs, and the others will have that one. So it split churches in half. There are no longer one. There's like two churches in every church, almost, based on what's your preferred style of worship. That's a bit of a problem, I'd say. But nevertheless... 
I was trying to make accommodations. I just threw these on here as I was looking at Google Images. I thought they were kind of funny. Uh, the first church on the left, for, established in 1846. The other one, 1993, Family Life and Praise Center. That guy's in a, a Hawaiian shirt. This one's in his tie. And they're both thinking the same thought. There but for the grace of God go I. <laughs> Neither one likes the other one's worship style. So what do you do for a living? I write modern choruses, worship service choruses. I write modern worship choruses. I write modern worship choruses. I write modern worship choruses, etc. Because as you know, a lot of them have very small phrases repeated maybe 10, 50 times in a song. Which is a mantra, by the way. When you have small little phrases repeated multiple times, that's a mantra, which is a technique used in other religions like Hinduism to obtain other altered states of consciousness. Hence you saw in like Three's Company growing up and you saw Chrissy, remember the blonde? Uh, Suzanne Summers, and she's sitting there doing her um, 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 or, or a particular phrase, trying to obtain an altered state of consciousness. That's what they're trying to do in a lot of these churches, have one phrase, small, sung 50 times in a song with different chords, trying to produce an altered state of consciousness. And that's considered worship if you can obtain that altered state of consciousness, that euphoria where you are in an, another kind of place. Okay. Um, this is something I just thought was funny that some say the evolution of church music looked like this. The guy worshiping over here, the second phrase, uh, and phase and Galway, and finally up there <laughs> with a rock guitar at the end. Um, that's just that person's. Winner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So now you have Christian rock bands. Um, those are, we're going to look a little bit more at those. And, um, you know, if you go to, uh, well, just take East Coast Christian Center versus us right now. Not versus, but um, compare in com comparison, I've talked with Pastor Kevin, used to be pastor over there that we know. He would say their problem was, uh, they have only young people at that church because they have heavy rock bands and he even started a heavy metal service there. He said, music doesn't matter. He said, it's only the words, which I disagree with. But nevertheless, they have young people. He says, an old person arrives at their church and lights for the door. They're out of there, generally speaking, not completely, but uh, because they can't get any young people to stay for their kind of service. We have a kind of diff opposite kind of thing, I said. We have a lot of more traditional and older people. God bless you all, you're young at heart. Uh, and sometimes we have a lot of young starting to come now, but I mean, it's been hard to get the young to come to a more traditional, formal service based in the way churches met as worship for the last 2000 years. Or to sing an older hymn, which is not as peppy and jazzy and emotional maybe as they might have over there. That's very exciting music, I'll, I'll freely admit. But is it feeding the church? The, go back to my theme. Is there a battle cry for you to fight the good fight of the faith, lay down your life, be loyal to your king, win the fight, win the battle, obtain the crown? That's what we need music for, ultimately. Although we can, at other times, supplement with other things for other experiences. But uh, Christian rock, there are Christian rock bands out there. I'll look at a few in a moment. But Hillstong's Tyus Smith. We're going to listen to some music in just a second. Tyus Smith, um, this is Hillsong. You know, Hillsong has a lot of their famous music these days. Okay, that's one of the biggest things on contemporary Christian music from the Australian church. It's grown and exploded all over the world. They have amazing music in a lot of ways, I will freely admit. And I've looked it up this week. I can hardly not listen to it. It's so magnetizing, or draws you in. Whether I, whether I like that or not, I don't know. But here's Taya Smith. But notice she has the short cut hair and almost a butch kind of haircut, purposefully, and dyed. And uh, does that mean anything? Should we judge by appearances? Should we racially profile and all those things? Not really, but we can also make some, some notes about that. That's a choice. And of course, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, remember, women used to wear head coverings in the 50s, and for the last 2,000 years, that stopped with the Jesus movement and on. 
And notice now it is to something that Paul says, for a woman to have her hair cut and shorn and shaving, shaven is a disgrace for her, unless you have cancer or something like that. But I mean, if you're going to totally do a crew cut, like I think she's been crew cut before, that is actually a sign of rebellion, according to 1 Corinthians 11. So that's just something not to make a judgment and condemn for, but to be, be like, warning, Dr. Smith, danger, high alert, be careful here. Why is she doing that? What is her statement on that? Why did she choose to do that? Is that a rebellion? Now, here we're going to go. Why do I choose traditional hymns instead of contemporary songs for the congregation's basic general singing in church? You know, not for every song that we ever sing, but basically. Let's just look at, this is a Lutheran Missouri Synod Church. Let's just look for about a minute, no, two minutes or so of this song. And then I'm going to compare it with a Hillsong song. And you can, I'll probably just, for the sake of time, show you what my thoughts are on it. But form your own thoughts as we listen. Music? Uh, the volume's up, really? Well, I mean, I can't know it until that comes on. It's different for everybody. Try to make some observations as you're going. you hear that guy at the end? Someone goes, whoo, <laughs> at the end of the service. <laughs> okay, I like that part. So that is uh, what we're talking about, the traditional militant hymn. Of course, they have a beautiful big church and they have a lot of talent and stuff that can go along with it. Let's take a look at now, just comparing that to just about a minute or so. Let me see. A minute of this one, which is Hillsong, uh, the Australian church. Uh, 142 to 301. So let's just keep in mind what you just saw and compare it to this is this is uh, the other end of the spectrum, so to speak.
There you go, there's a good uh, comparison between two very different types of worship styles, wouldn't you say? Yes. And did, they, did it make you feel differently? Yes. It draws you in, that's for sure. Oh, I mean, every time I've been trying to get you examples of this song or this hell song or elevation, I'm just like, I'm like, it's like amazing music. I'm like, I can't get it out of my head or stop listening almost. But it definitely affects you differently, doesn't it? How did you feel the first time? Joyful. Joyful. Maybe bright. Reverent. Reverent. Sure. Okay, peaceful. Mm -hmm. There's a different focus though as well, I think. Uh, and the focus is, if you look at the first song, which is not a, that's not an old hymn either. That's a, uh, that was written by Gustav Holst, and it was uh, part of the class the, uh, theory. The thing was, when you saw that, you're not elevating the musicians. You, what yeah. the people focused on the cross, yeah. and they're focused on um, on the guy here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're focused on the rock singers, which I wonder would they? And you've heard me say this before, Pastor, but would they be as excited about that if the singers were not on a stage? but instead we're in an orchestra pit. Yeah. So we could hear their music but not see... Or they weren't as good. Yeah, this so is, I'm going to jump ahead of on, myself here. Your focus is on that girl. Yes. But also the song is focused more on... Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think it's very okay. we yeah. uh -huh. me. Okay, we and me. Okay. Yeah, and me. yeah just, 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 just to get you back in the mood of this one, just for a second. <laughs> See, um, it is a great hymn, and I like both songs, I'll just admit that, but I will say it moves me differently. If I'm going to fight the devil, which one am I going to need in the midst of the fight, is my question. If I am in uh, the, 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 the sting of battle, and, and there are swords and arrows flying and shields, I'm going to need that one, you know. Um, no, no, I'm not saying that you can't use other things. That's why I say you can supplement, but I'm saying the, the thrust here is what do I believe should be the, the main uh, thrust of the congregational singing at church for the Christian needing strength for the fight. Yeah. Let's try to make them fairly short just because I need a, I have a lot to get through. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, we, have a, we have the cross over here that we can use. Yeah, you can have it occasionally, a crucifix, that's okay. Well, that, that's, that's something I've heard a lot of, and that's fine, and I kind of like it, I prefer it that way, but, we, but Lutherans are okay to remember that Christ, we preach Christ crucified as well. So, there are some Lutheran churches that do have the crucifix, yes. I mean, the, the Christ on it. Um, let me just... Uh, this is a quick comment, and then I'll explain why I would choose traditional hymns for our church, even though I really like that other one. Um, I'll say this in passing before I start. Those lists, which is over here. But uh, if you sing this one, notice that was just a local congregation. They had a lot of people there, so they had some talent. But you can tell their trumpets were off slightly, and their voices were not perfect, but it still came out well. 
if you sing contemporary music, in my estimation, this is my view, at a church, and you don't have like unbelievably great talent, talent, it comes off really bad. So you, you, can, you can sing this one with not the perfect talent. The other one I think, at every church I've been to that tries to do contemporary worship music that doesn't have like amazing musicians, it's like, ugh. Um, but if you have amazing musicians, East Coast, I went there once, I'm like, these guys could be on the road there, they were that good. These are the reasons I choose, and they're gonna go with my little sheet here. These are the reasons I choose it, um, just let you know where I stand on it anyway. Um, is I would choose the march rhythm over the dancing and swaying back. Notice the rhythm was very different. Uh, amen, O oh Lord, amen, versus the other one was very much, it's the type of music that you close your eyes like they're doing, swaying back and forth, or in some other such things, they're jumping up and down like this, you know, but you're swaying back and forth. So notice there's a different rhythm there. <clears throat> um, versus the dance rhythm over there, versus a march. You know, I feel the, 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 the devil, <laughs> you know, pressing me continually to destroy me. He prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have to resist him firm in our faith. And so if you're going to, um, if you're going to fight, I just need, I need, I need fighting music at least as the steady diet. Not to, I would say there, I've often said, that's the meat and potatoes, the nutrition, some of the other stuff is dessert. I can have some dessert on occasion. Okay, fine. But I don't want to live on dessert. Uh, this is a very small point. But notice the difference in formality versus casual. This is how people used to dress. Notice the women always had have coverings, which we ought to cover sometime. That was in 1 Corinthians 11. But they always had have cover, hover, coverings for 2,000 years until, oh, really, basically the 70s. Right? And then it all disappeared. Um, notice to these days you can get to come to church like this in a modern church service, and that's really cool. In fact, the pastor will dress that way to be all the more accessible to his congregation sometimes. Here's another one. Um, number three is one music, the first one we looked at, I think really is lifting up Jesus as the king. Think of how many songs we have. Crown him with many crowns. Oh, worship the king. Uh, the advent of our God. Uh, the king shall come when morning dawns. Um, uh, uh, ride on, ride on in majesty. You know, there's all king, 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 king. And we're bowing to the king. We're serving the king. We're worshiping God as the king, the great royal one, who has shown his mercy to, to give his life and send the prince to save his, his country, his people, his kingdom, and to make for them a kingdom. Versus the romantic lover view of Jesus, which the other song that we just listened to, Anytime You Need a Kiss, I Have One Waiting for You, that kind of Jesus. You notice that other song, I think for a guy, women will not get this at all, but when you hear that beautiful looking woman, woman in the dark at a rock concert singing that song, I'm desperate for you, I'm lost without you, you are the air I breathe, your holy presence living in me. That's a little sexy to a guy, maybe not to a girl, but I'll tell you, guys would go to that because they're feeling something great going on, but is it holy? I'm just saying that a lot of that, if you didn't put the word Lord in there, you wouldn't know that there was about Jesus. That could easily be singing about your lover and, and intimacy uh, with your lover. You know what I'm saying, though? You could, you, could, you could take those words, you could take that song, and easily take the word Jesus out and you could be singing about your boyfriend or you know that you love and you're sleeping with how do you distinguish that from from singing to Jesus okay let's go on here to a few other things doctrinal content versus broad generic words um, the the traditional hymns generally <laughs> generally are very specific um, we praise you and acknowledge you I just opened that out here try to move along here um, do, 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 do. You laid aside your glory. We're born of virgin's womb. We're crucified for us and we're placed into a tomb. Then by your resurrection, you won for us reprieve and opened heaven's kingdom to all who would believe. I mean, you could preach on that for a couple of weeks with all the good doctrine just in that half of a verse. Whereas I'm desperate for you, I'm lost without you. There's no doctrinal content. Some of the songs like 
Hosanna, which is another amazing one sung by another luscious lush <laughs> of a girl. Um, Hosanna, it's, she just sings Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Uh, and there's no doctrinal content to it, really. It's very generic. If there is some, it's usually pretty light. You know why? Because contemporary Christian music is an industry. And they will not allow doctrinal specific songs that only the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod can sing. Because, because the Catholics won't buy them or the generic population, they want as many people to buy these as possible so that you, you, you're not allowed to be doctrinally specific. I like songs that only Christians can sing. We Praise You and Acknowledge You, which we looked at there, um, you know, is uh, only Christians can sing that song and believe it. Whereas This Is The Air I Breathe or Hosanna, um, you know what? You could be a Muslim, I'm talking about a Hindu. And you could sing, uh, what is the song, how's it go? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, etc. That's easy. A, a, Mus a, a Hindu could sing that song and worship Krishna. So to have songs that only Christians can sing, I think is a very key thing to do. Not to say that you can't use those other songs to worship God, but a song that is not specific, that only Christians can sing, I think there's a, something to be said for that. Remember that in Revelation 15, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, only the redeemed of the earth could sing it, nobody else could. Remember that? If you don't, look it up, Revelation 15. Also, when I, when I see the first song versus the second one, this is what I experience partially, is a clear and sober mind, like I feel clear, bright, sober in my faith, versus an altered state of consciousness. I feel almost like a tractor beam in the second one. I'm like, oh, that's so beautiful. And, ah, but I'm like, I'm losing my mental uh, distinguishing between good and evil, right and wrong, uh, clarity. It just feels like, oh, it feels so good. But I'm like, where am I? What dimension have I arrived in? That's just my experience. Notice, by the way, also in this one, that's the emotional out of the holiness movement, uh, Methodist roots growing up. And notice the guy, by the way, is wearing a hat. Now you've got the guys wearing hats and the girls not wearing hats, contrary to 1 Corinthians 11 again. So that's another interesting point I just saw on there. I'm not saying that these guys aren't worshiping. And Marcia uh, referred to the thing I mentioned the other time um, about how, you know, we, we're not judging their judging them and pointing our finger and say we're so much better than you are type of thing because we don't want to uh, remember Michael judged David dancing before the Lord and she was judged so we're not we don't want to point our finger down we just want to be discerning that's all we're about here we want to be careful that's why we're doing this study is just be careful about what you're letting into yourself because notice the difference between these two I also notice is one is done in light one is done in darkness a lot of times, even if you go to East Coast Christian, and I hope the best for them, but I've been to their worship services, it's in the dark, at least the ones I've been to. And they had uh, smoke coming out for, from a mosh pit, and they have, I think they have strobe lights. It's more like a concert, and it's a concert, versus this one's in, done in full brightness of light. Uh, I think it's, it's very big tell that the church is worshiping in the dark. Who's the prince of darkness? I mean, we, we want to be in the light. We are people of the light, of the daytime. We're not people of nighttime. So just be careful. Be discerning, oh church, my brothers and sisters, when we listen to stuff. What's going on here, you got to ask? Be suspicious. Be on alert, is all I'm saying. I want to be careful that whatever I'm singing can be done in brightness, daytime, light. Uh, and the angels would look down on my service, whatever it is, and go like, we love this, this is great, this is the way we do it in heaven, versus, ugh, you know, if the angels are sort of hiding their faces, and that kind of convicts me sometimes, I've listened to some soft rock songs that I kind of like, and I'm like, are the angels rejoicing in this one, Greg? You know, light versus darkness, this is something that, um, that uh, I heard last week, worship Notice in the first, first one was forward, all the musicians are in the back of the church 
driving the congregation forward to worship towards the altar, really, right? So it's a forward motion to the service versus the, all your artists are now up front with lights on a stage and they're throwing the music at you, which you were mentioning last week that kind of subdues you a little more passively rather than driving you behind you forward into the uh, service. Also notice this one is very military style, ranks. This one is usually in a big, uh, usually semicircular kind of thing, not ranks. You're not an army anymore so much. Masculine versus feminine, okay. You can disagree with me here. I mentioned at the beginning that men and women hear things differently, okay? Um, but uh, I think the music that is Hillsong is attractive to women for a certain way, perhaps, emotionally. It's attractive to men for a different reason, because the girl's hot and she's singing and she's pretty and it draws you in. Um, where is the, uh, okay, I, I read an article once um, from some guy, was LCMS guy sitting behind another, <laughs> a man and a woman at a worship service that was very contemporary. And he noticed the woman was up here just loving it and they're told to clap and she was happy to clap because women don't mind clapping, right? It, and there, she was going like this and all that stuff and the guy looked like he was a fish out of water, squirming. It was so, he just felt very unmanly doing that. Women can do things that men can't do. You can wear things that we would never wear as men, you know, and you love to do that. Men and women are different. And I think a lot of men sometimes in some of these worship services feel very uncomfortable because it's very feminine. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but, but uh, a man I think would really enjoy the second, that second one because the girl's pretty and it's very, and it makes it feel like I can be a Christian and it's cool. I can still be of the world and, uh, and be a Christian at the same time. I kind of look at, I found this picture on Google. I'll try to go as fast as I can here. I have so many more things to share. I was going to finish tonight. Okay, that's kind of like the old worship service. And that's kind of like the new worship service in my estimation. You know, they can maybe both be there and helpful, but um, one has its look off in the distance and that, and this one's just kind of very intimate and close and more sensual, I guess you could say. It would be um, the difference again between Jesus as king and Jesus as lover. I actually, uh, a girl was interested in me way years ago before I was ever married, and I remember her, we were talking over the phone, we hadn't even met, but she, we were having a nice phone conversation, and she said, uh, you know, how to describe Jesus and everything. I was like, he's my king. And, uh, and she was like, Jesus is my lover. And I remember thinking, he's your lover? You think of him as, a, as an intimate lover? She's like, yeah, just an intimate lover. I'm like, wow, I never heard of that before. But I mean, I'm like, now I know where she gets it, or got it, you know? Um, I think from the worship services. But what is the fruit of it? What are you getting out of it? Um, you all may experience different things. For me, out of the first one, I get fortitude, courage, and the desire to lay down my life for the king. That's what I get out of it, and worship. And I felt, it's not that it isn't emotional. When I get an emotional response from that first one, the emotional response is on the basis of the doctrine being sung, versus how cool the chords are. Because you can get chords that create emotional responses. But to me, the first one gave me an emotional response. I felt a little jolt of the Holy Spirit as I watched it. Because, um, because of the doctrine, because of the worship of God. So just watch and you be discerning when you listen to music about the fruit of it. What are you experiencing? What is it doing to you? I tried to worship with Hosanna and uh, Hillsong music some years ago because I'm like, it seems like they really are worshiping and I'm not worshiping as well as they are. So I tried it for a little while and I was like, it just feels like something's off here, Greg. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm not feeling like Holy, I'm just feeling like, well, lusty, I gotta say. The origins of the music. Oh, this is what I wanted to cover, but now we're getting close to the end. Okay. These services need to be about an hour and a half at least. Every week I get into this problem. 
the origins of the music, in other words, if you're going to drink the water, you want to know what's upstream, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Is that a sewer plant or is that a pristine mountain lake? You want to know where it's coming from. You want to discern it. I was going to show this to you. Maybe it's best I don't show it to you. Amy Grant. She is the darling of American Christian good little girl, right? Isn't she? Isn't she? She was. She was. And she's, you know, she's wholesome and seeming. She sang all those things. She was the picture of it. And frankly, she really helped my wife Beth through a difficult time. Beth credits her with saving her through a very difficult time of her life before she met me and everything became wonderful. No, just kidding. <laughs> Look at this. Did you, I guess, I just, hang on, guys. You just got to see this for, just really briefly. This is only a few seconds of her video. She's the Christian singer. What do you notice here in this video? Turn it up. Again. It's very dark, but you only recognize it. Okay, we'll do it. Oopsie, sorry. Okay, what did you think so far about that one? Not good. Okay, it's a, it's a catchy song. Again, I kind of like the song, but where do we know to hear Huh? It's not Christian. Hang on one second. Right there? Okay. At this point, <laughs> it's been picked out by some Christian commentators. She's dressed in a red dress, which is used in witchcraft for seductive lust uh, uh, services. Okay. And then notice what is she flashing here? I get a better picture of it on my thing here. What has she got? A star. What kind of star is it? Take, here's a better picture. You can see that one. Hang on, I'll make it bigger. If you guys need to go, just let me know, but I just got to show you this. What do you see there? A hexagram. Five, six pointed star. What does that use? And do you think that's an accident? No. Would you, as a Christian artist, allow someone to put that upon you to go out into millions of people? What is that? That's a hex. Hexagram, that's where you make hexes. That's a curse, isn't it? Even though I kind of liked the song, is that a song you want to listen to? Are you being careful, Christian? Let's just skim through a couple more of these. Jars of Clay, you've heard of them? Well, their band leader, I think it was, came out in support of gay marriage. Some of these have said, I'm not even a Christian anymore. Michael W. Smith, you like him? We've some, sung of those, uh, what are his songs? Do, do, do. I'm going to have to. What is his songs? I have his song somewhere. Uh, he's saying, he has some good songs, whatever. But notice, if you're a Christian artist, I'll have to stop here and just finish up next week, okay? I hate to end on a dark note. I'll listen on a bright note. But look at this. Do you see anything wrong with this picture? This is his album cover. Michael W. Smith. Any problem with those? That? What's the problem? He's writing his name backwards. What does the writing a name backwards mean? No, it's not Hebrew. I wish it were Hebrew. Oh, please, I wish it were Hebrew. It's from the Satanic Bible. It's writing your name, writing backwards is a sign of Satanism. And I'm like, I don't know if he did it or whether his producers that were putting out his stuff did it. But notice again, to write your name backwards, that's a problem. At least enough for a Christian to go like, hmm, I wonder if this is something I should be concerned about or not. And secondly, notice the, the alphabet that he uses is a runic alphabet. See, he's using these types of letters. It's a runic alphabet used by occultists, right? Michael W. Smith, here he does again. He writes his name backwards. And notice, here's his Christmas time album, and he has his name like this, and he forms that shape with his body yeah. and that shape with this chair. Why on earth would this guy be out in the middle of the woods in the winter for Christmas time picture Standing like that on a chair. Does that make any sense? Shouldn't he be, I don't know, hanging by the Yuletide carol and having some fire and some eggnog or something? Why that is my question. 
And at the very least, a Christian should go, hmm, I wonder if this is a problem. I wonder if I should be paying attention to this. Other bands, or Christian rock bands, that's what tr they work, look like these days. Uh, all right, well, I'll often conclude with the rest next time. I was going to finish up on Hillsong, but I had a video to show you on that one. Um, let's, let's jump to the end. Okay, I'll just, I'll just, I won't show you the, those pictures. Here's the Hillsong singers again, Brooke Frazier. Brooke Lickerwood, was that, that's, that's one of the Hillsong singers. Would you come to church if that was your worship leader? No. Don't answer, man. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think, I want to see her perform. No, oh, okay. Hillsong has the Naked Cowboy, the same band that's given you and me this is the air I breathe. They also have a women's conference where one of their pastors came out, naked, well, wearing underwear behind a guitar, the Naked Cowboy. I'll show you a video of them sometime, short clip. Um, they, they, have, they had a Naked Santa as well and other things. Is that the kind of church that you want if you're looking upstream from the drink that you're drinking and you're wondering, is that a pristine mountain lake or is that a, is that a, a sewer? place. What am I drinking here? You want to see the root of this church. This is what they do in other services. And I'll show you one next week on this clip of what they do. It's, it's, it's crazy. They've had sex scandals at the church. And let's just end with this one. Um, again, this is what I, I just want to end on a positive note. You know, I love Robin Hood. I love all the brightness of that. I like, I want this to be, if I can, the way I will give you the encouragements of inspiration for your life to run the good rough fight of the right, uh, race of the, of the Christian, to fight the good fight, to cross the finish line, to defeat the enemy, to come before the king and for him to crown you as, as, uh, as, uh, with the crown of righteousness uh, to those who have loved him and, uh, and to worship the king. This is just a few seconds at the end of a Robin Hood score here. I hope that this would be your life and, uh, and your victory in Christ. And that's what I want to give you. Turn up. Wouldn't that be great if you got to the end of your life and that's the way it looked like? Yeah. Hello, let's get rid of that. Go, go away, go away, go away. Wouldn't that be great if that was the end of your life and you've, you've finally finished and you've come through and you've kept the faith and you've, you've, you've shown for Christ and at the end of it, you just go, sir, like that and, you're, and you've arrived and you've crossed the finish line and you're in the kingdom uh, up above and wouldn't that be great? That's what I want to give you. That's why I want you to have that kind of music that's going to inspire for you for that kind of life. And uh, if you want to use some of the other stuff for supplements, okay, I'll leave that to you, but be discerning, okay? All right, well, thank you for listening. We'll, we'll uh, pick up with another topic, picking up with the book of Daniel next week after a little review of all this discernment that we've done to cap it off, okay? God's blessings to you. Let's uh, go to prayer.